my name is Pavel Serbajlo. Uh, I am the CTO at Exponia. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my history first uh, so that you know uh, from what, what title I'm going to uh, discuss the topic about Silicon Valley here. And the most notable one uh, was called MDAT. I was a co-founder and a core developer uh, of the product, which was a, a tool that allowed small businesses to create their websites right from the smartphone. We would also host the whole solution on our side, so we would simplify it for those small businesses as much as possible. Uh, we moved to Silicon Valley, me and my co-founder, uh, to uh, basically learn more about how to build the best possible SAAS products. We wanted to connect with like-minded people. Uh, and eventually, after a year of, of uh, raising uh, finances from investors and discussing possible partnerships, uh, we ended up acquired by GoDaddy, which is the world's largest domain registrar in the world. Uh, in total, I lived in California for about four years, and I had a lot of chances to uh, learn and understand more about the culture there. How do people live there? How they work? Uh, what are their values? And stuff like that. Before I start, uh, there's a disclaimer. Some of the things I'm going to tell you during this speech may sound as a generalization. It's just my opinion, my observations. And it's not always absolute true for everyone. There are always exceptions. So just bear that in mind, please. So what is Silicon Valley? We are engineers. We love numbers. So let me tell you a few numbers so that you can imagine better what's the landscape there like. There's around 30,000 startups there at, at the time, with average $5 million uh, valuation. That means that a huge number of those startups are actually funded. There's around 150 no, public companies there. Those are the companies that you keep hearing about from news, media, uh, basically on a daily basis. We also use a lot of products from these companies as well. There are also so-called unicorns. Unicorns can, can be a public and private company that reaches $1 billion of valuation. Uh, I have separated unicorns here. This means that there's around 100 private unicorns just yet. What's relevant for us, MongoDB is one of those companies, for instance. There's around 20,000 accredited investors there. If you compare the startups, that means that there's a lot of opportunities for startups to actually get funded and to uh, uh, have the chance to validate their ideas. This is an interesting number. The average salary of the software engineer in Silicon Valley is $120,000. This is an average. There is no exception that the salary, it's an annual salary, by the way that this salary could be multiples of this number. On the other hand, a typical startup founder, they pay themselves only around $40,000 a year. That's barely to make a living there. They do everything to reduce the cost to validate their ideas and to make their startup successful. The whole Silicon Valley in its last 40 years or so uh, created around 50. Uh, tech billionaires, which is quite a large number if you consider the area. The Silicon Valley is a rather small geographical area, and yet it creates a wealth of 6% of the whole United States. That means that it's a very notable place uh, for the whole U.S. economy, and the U.S. shouldn't really forget about uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, what are some of the trends uh, in uh, workplace. 
So what's going on in there? We know that some of the things get reflected here sooner or later, so let's discuss that. Typically, those environments are built in a way that uh, you not only work there, but you play there. It's this work hard, play hard environment. And it's basically designed that you don't want to leave. If you are at work, you are more likely to do some kind of work. Even if you play, you might sit behind the computer later on and do something. Uh, this is huge. Culture, productive culture, positive focus. Companies focus on that a lot. They understand it's not just the engineering. Engineering itself is not the competitive advantage anymore. And I heard a great quote, and unfortunately I do not remember who said that, that the product is a reflection of a culture. And I fully agree with that. Flexible working hours, we all know that. They perfected it in Silicon Valley already. They really don't care about where you are at, how often you leave, if you work in the midnight or during the day, as long as you join the important meetings, you are free to do whatever you want with your time. It's really project-based. It's, it's based on the work that you actually do, not about the time that you sit behind your desk and do the actual work. Silicon Valley can't really inflate more. It's rather small area. Not a lot of people fit there. It has its problems. I will discuss that later. And that's why there's a lot of remote work opportunities there. Uh, it's growing. New tools online allow that. So uh, this, I expect this to grow even more over time. Perks. We all love swag and, and, and perks at work and, and uh, free lunch and free cinema tickets and stuff like that. Uh, they understand it's just a convenience. It won't grant happiness at work. So they are trying to focus more on how to engage you at work. You need to feel challenged and you need to feel that you are growing and solving the good problems. And um, honestly, I like that. The developer interview process is changing a lot as well. Uh, while typically they would focus on hard riddles and algorithms, they now understand it's not really the most important thing about engineers. It's really about the cultural fit. It's about the values, motivations, aspirations, and they try to focus on that. That's why sometimes the interview process takes several months to complete. They want to get to know you. Um, another one is unlimited vacations. You might have heard of it. I'm not aware if any company in Slovakia implemented it just yet. It sounds nice, but it's a trap. The problem with unlimited vacations is that it has one rule. They, they tried several iterations, but it has one rule. You can take vacation as long as you are not blocking anyone else. With that rule, it creates an unnecessary peer pressure, I would say. And that leads into much less consumption of vacation days than you would take if you would have like a pool of 20 or 25, 25 days. So that's an interesting fact. All right, let's focus on some differences that I noticed during my time at Silicon Valley. Move fast and break things. This is a quote from Mark Zuckerberg. I think it perfectly describes what they are trying to do there. They are challenging the status quo. Uh, but I would say it doesn't describe solely uh, the, the Facebook culture, but whole Silicon Valley culture. He captured it really well with this quote. Uh, I would say it describes their will to, uh, you know, to change things, radically change things. There is this can-do attitude. The culture there is really positive. They can do everything. They will tell you, hey, yeah, of course I can do that. Yeah, this is not a problem. These are the typical answers that you keep hearing in Silicon Valley. The problem is you keep hearing that even if 
they can do that. They believe that, hey, if I don't know it now, I will just learn that on, as I go. Uh, if you learn how to filter this a little bit, if you understand where the truth is and when they are you know, a little bit over the edge, it's a good, I think it's, it's much better than to hear, hey, this can't be done without any other options, right? Customer focus. We all say we do it, but we don't. Uh, in Silicon Valley, customer is in the center of the universe. They keep thinking about the needs of those customers, how to address it, how they think, how to, they, how to get under their skins. That's why most Silicon Valley products are, you know, they keep you hooked in because they think about how you think. And this is, this is really embedded in their culture a lot. And there's a lot we can learn from that, but to a certain extent. Team play being a very important part of culture in Silicon Valley. Not just Silicon Valley, but US in general. I would say this is based uh, on their education system already, where students are forced to do a lot of uh, group projects. They are forced to pitch their ideas, to pitch their projects. Uh, the way they, they basically uh, addressed uh, this whole uh, education area is really good. Second pillar to that would be workplaces, where they promote a team play a lot. You can create certain feature teams. Uh, you can discuss with your peers in a way that's not really typical in here. I won't go into details here. And it really, it's really reflected even on a business level. I'll share a story that uh, we had when we we were in Silicon Valley with MDOT, our product, and we would be meeting our possible business partners. We had the chance to meet with the CEO of Weebly, David Rusenko. Weebly is one of the largest uh, website builders and website hosting companies in the world. And we had an amazing time talking to him, but what was great is that even though we were his direct competitors, he was absolutely willing to share their biggest challenges from early stage of their business. That was shocking for me, uh, really eye-opening, and I've never witnessed anything like that here in the Central European and Eastern European area, and I think that we need to learn that. This kind of openness, this kind of knowledge and information sharing, this is something that, that that's a, like one of the cornerstone, cornerstones of, of Silicon Valley itself. There's a really tight connection between private companies and universities. This is something that happens here as well, but it's not as systematic as in Silicon Valley. They understand that uh, this is a win-win-win situation for everyone. On one side, it's a student who's able to apply all, all his learnings in practice. The other side, you have the university. The university can has an added value for their students. And for companies, they can tap on the best talent right away, even before they leave the university. It's really the perfected, perfected solution there, and this is something that we can definitely learn from. I already discussed the can-do attitude. Reducing negative emotions is kind of similar, but different beast. Uh, I would say that uh, they try to discuss only, or let's say the difference. What we are used to is that we discuss the things that are good and things that are bad. In their environment, they are used to discuss things that are good and that could be better. This, this captures that difference in thinking. With that in mind, they reduce a lot of unnecessary stress in their workplace, uh, possible conflicts, I've never witnessed an open conflict in the wild, in Silicon Valley, for instance. Uh, this is great on one side, but it's, uh, it's so obvious sometimes that for us coming from this region with a different culture, it, it 
feels like a sterile, sterile environment to a certain extent. But definitely something that we can learn from as well. Here's the thing with culture of trust. They, they have it embedded in their hiring and recruiting already. As I said before, they spend quite a lot of time with their candidates because they want to get to know them. And they want to get to know them so that they can gain the trust that this is the best possible candidate for the job. And if he's the best possible candidate, we, we need to trust him up front. In here, we basically do a quick recruitment process and then we have to learn who this guy actually is. That creates a lot of unnecessary micromanagement on our side. I haven't seen a micromanagement culture in Silicon Valley. I have seen a culture of coaching and mentoring, which is great. I don't fully agree with everything Steve Jobs has ever said and done, but this quote captures it really well. It doesn't make sense to hire smart people and tell them what to do. We hire smart people so they can tell us what to do. Fully agree with that. People in Silicon Valley tend to risk a lot. And I mean in their life. They're kind of fearless to a certain extent. Even though they have families, kids, they're absolutely willing to join a small startup with, for instance, just a six to 12 months financial runway. They just go in, uh, they take less or lower salary, rather take higher equity uh, or options uh, because they believe in the founders, they believe in the idea or prospect of that business and they are willing to take that risk. And I've witnessed that on every on, on everyday basis. It was really awesome. And on the other way, there's this permission to fail. You might have heard of it uh, from Silicon Valley. They try to embed this in, the, in their culture, and it's great uh, because uh, it's permission to fail. If you learn from your failing in some way, it's not really a fail. And the best stories in Silicon Valley are made by a repeated failure that's followed by a success. Openness and diversity. There are people, engineers, from all over the world, regardless their age, gender, race, religion, mother language, you name it. Basically, in their hiring funnel, there's no artificial limitation. They accept everyone who's the best candidate for the job. Uh, that's what actually drives all the people from all around the world to Silicon Valley. If you create some kind of artificial filters based on these conditions, all you get is probably local people you have to work with, but that's it. Legislation is a huge cornerstone of Silicon Valley. On one, one side, you could have seen that in all the American movies, like, you're fired, I quit. It's absolutely possible there. It's called at-will employment. At-will employment means that there's no contract per se. And while you can't do that, I wouldn't suggest that. It's customary that you give at least 14 days notice from each of the sides. Uh, another thing in legislation would be how easy and convenient it is to start a company. And third one is how flexible companies are with working with their equity and option plans. That means that they can easily distribute equities to all the early employees or even later employees through the option plan. And this is definitely something that we need here. This is what restricts uh, some of the startups and, and, and young businesses to offer better benefits besides just a simple salary. So it feels like Silicon Valley is great based on that. Is that true? Not really. There are even downsides. I heard uh, 
a, a good quote from one of the people behind Slovensko Digital, Jano Suchal, and he said that if you can't describe the downsides, you probably don't understand the subject well enough. I agree with that. So let's dive deep into the downsides. Move fast and break things. I discussed that as a positive, as a good thing in their culture, but it has its downsides. If you take it too far, you start breaking things that shouldn't be broken. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, as an example to that, I'm, I deeply apologize to all the JavaScript fans, but the whole JavaScript stack for me is a huge example of that problem. Meetings. Now, imagine that they, sp they basically take away all those problems like conflicts at the workplace, positive culture, good communication, and all that saved time, they just use it to meetings. We have all these kind of meetings like status reports, sync up, follow up, one-on-ones, plus if you are a software engineer, you have all the agile ceremonies as well. Agile and Scrum uh, methodology, uh, it has its problems as well. Uh, I invite you to a talk of my coworker, Matyo Stricek, this afternoon. He will discuss a little bit more about Scrum, so I won't dive deep into that. Technical qualities of local talent. I will probably will get crucified by some of my friends uh, who grew up in Silicon Valley and are great software engineers. I have to say it up front, all my friends from Silicon Valley are great software engineers, but I have to say it. The best software engineers in Silicon Valley are coming from other countries. That's, that's the pattern that I actually realized. Uh, yeah, I'm not saying there are really bad developers over there, but the best are coming from elsewhere because those people have to overcome different challenges as well. It's not about simple technical skill, it's about what kind of people they are, about their values and some kind of a vision. And being in a completely different environment, speaking a different language than your mother language and so on, it keeps you pushing, not just at work, but even during your everyday life. And for, for that reason, these people are better candidates for the job. Often. Positive discrimination. Before I dive deep into this one, I have to say that I fully support diversion in the workplace uh, or even in the culture of any country. But again, if you take it way too far, you may notice that sometimes people get hired not based on their uh, fit for the job, but based on their gender, race, whatever is necessary to submit or to, to, to showcase a better numbers in the quarterly diversity reports. Uh, I, I would say that we just need to keep this realistic and uh, it's not about what should be done but how we do that. Another huge problem, and this is a set of problems, is about the whole life in Silicon Valley. Uh, in, in tech segment, engineers, and not just in engineers, but everyone involved, they get kind of you know, large salaries. But other, other segments, like let's say the whole services segments, they don't get this much money. What it causes is, like a cost of that is that the rent goes, it's skyrocketing. Like for a small studio or a one bedroom apartment in Silicon Valley or in San Francisco, it, you can pay four to five thousand dollars. It's a whooping amount. What it causes is that all the lower income people in Silicon Valley, they have to move elsewhere. They are typically moving on the other side of the bay to East Bay, and there are just three bridges there. So what it causes subsequently is that 
it creates a huge traffic gridlocks on everyday basis. Because the, more and more people have to move from one place to another because they can't afford to live where they work. And what this causes is a growing hate of general public towards the tech segment. Like public protests and demonstrations in San Francisco, it's something that you might be seeing more and more often. That's why remote opportunities are growing so much because Silicon Valley can't really inflate very much and these kind of problems there are stagnant at this moment. This doesn't mean Bachelor of Science. If, if in doubt, just Google it. Uh, you can encounter inflated CVs in recruitment all the time, for instance. Uh, as an example, you can, you can easily read that, hey, this candidate, he's a graduate of computer science at Stanford. He'll probably be awesome. And now what happened to me two times already is that, all right, I got this candidate for an interview. I wanted him to solve some kind of a problem, and it wasn't really a riddle. A riddle. It was rather a simple algorithm that involved a recursion. He was unable to complete a recursion. I was in shock. When I realized that, and when that happened for the second time, I realized, all right, A, there might be a problem with education at Stanford, but I doubt that. B, whatever he wrote on his CV is probably not true. I even encountered cases where personal agencies representing the, the, this candidate would be handcrafting their CVs. You can't really believe what you see, so you actually realize that you have to evaluate everything, verify absolutely everything that's being written because you can't trust that. And the more people are being driven to Silicon Valley, the more the stagnant, the more stagnant the problem is because they have to compete with each other, right? So uh, I would say, be careful. This guy is creating some kind of concerns in Silicon Valley uh, because of his planned immigration reforms and things that he's doing. Uh, this is already causing problems. Uh, I read an article from Y Combinator, which is one of the most known accelerators in Silicon Valley. They heard from foreign startup founders that they are reluctant in applying to another batch because they don't know what's going to happen on the immigration front. No one really knows what's going to happen and how is it going to affect Silicon Valley, but the truth is at the moment that more than 50% of all the companies founded in Silicon Valley are founded by immigrants or children of immigrants. So it's the culture that's special. I discussed a lot of cultural aspects of Silicon Valley. These are the aspects that we don't have here. We don't have in basically any other place in the world but Silicon Valley. There's this, this culture, this, this move fast and break things culture, which uh, they're using to make not just products and technology better, but even the way they interact with each other, they think about customers, they think about their business, they think about everything around them. They iterate fast on that, and we are playing this catch-up game. I'm not saying we should be trying to create another Silicon Valley uh, anywhere else. We should just compete with Silicon Valley by you know, learning what works for them and applying that on the culture based on the history that we have on our side. I would just say we shouldn't really settle for status quo and say, hey, it's just the way it is here. Let's try to do something about it and we can definitely start with our own workplaces, right? Thank you very much for joining me for uh, this talk in this early morning. I know that Saturday mornings are probably the most rough day to wake up early. Uh, if you are interested in this topic, and if you are interested in learning uh, what we are implementing at, at Exponia uh, to be one of the 
uh, best companies in the world and uh, that has the culture set right, but also what we are doing to become one of the best employers in, the, in this region. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pavel. And uh, there is a number of questions with a ton of upvotes, so let's, let's go right, uh, right to them. So the most upvotes uh, was given to the question, how many hours per day do people usually spend at work in Silicon Valley? You work in a small startup, you don't even leave. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so 24? Uh, typically, uh, I'll, I'll expand on that. Typically, small startups are reducing costs by renting houses. And they basically, if, if they have a team to up to 10 people or so, they, they work from that place, they live from that place, typically together, because most of those people are single, without families, and so on. Even if they have family, they have to spend their lot of time, because time is the essence. Okay, what is the fluctuation rate in, in the valley? It used to inflate a lot, and I would say like five years ago, something has started to change because of all those issues I discussed. Uh, and there are another areas emerging in the United States. One of those notable areas is a Seattle larger area where companies like Microsoft and Amazon are based and it's getting huge over there as well. So people are even moving, and, uh, and I've noticed a lot of people, even my friends, moving from Silicon Valley to Seattle. Okay, and we have time for one more. And uh, what uh, interviewing practices did you consciously adapt from Silicon Valley? A bunch of those. Uh, this would take for a book, not a sim simple question in the auditorium, so whoever wrote that, just stop by at our booth and I can discuss details, but uh, to, to pinpoint a few important details, it's about the trust for the candidate. That means that you have to understand what does the candidate value? What are the motivations, aspirations? What kind of person that is in general? Uh, if he's a cultural fit, obviously if he has the technical skills that you need. But even if he doesn't have the technical skills necessary, uh, you need to evaluate whether he is able, whether he's got the drive to learn that. That's more important than you know, all the learnings that, that he got up to that point. Drive to learn, that's really awesome. Well, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, Pavel Serbailov. Thank you.